Well, after the extremely anticlimactic end to Heart of the Swarm, I'm more than happy to report that Legacy of the Void has an actual difficulty curve that just doesn't cease to exist. Or, uh, a beginning that's actually possible? Hopefully. Again, mandatory opening disclaimers, this is the third part of a series, so I do go more in depth with the rules in Wings of Liberty, but everything is pretty simple. I can't make any pylons or nexuses, meaning that the supply we start with is what we get. Obviously, if there are events in a mission where we gain more supply automatically, such as finding structures throughout the map or gaining control of our base after an introductory segment, those won't count against us for very blatant reasons. Also, specifically for Legacy of the Void, we will not allow the Deploy Pylon, nor will we allow the Warp in Reinforcements ability, since that is still technically building pylons. However, we will allow the Spear of a Dune upgrade for additional starting supply. And I know some of you may disagree with that statement, however, trust me when I say it really doesn't add a whole lot. With that out of the way, obviously the first mission is a no-build mission where the challenge has no considerable impact, but the next mission is an absolute nightmare. This mission we start with three stalkers and a base that, uh, isn't powered, meaning we can't build any units. Well, that's fine, we can just go ahead and find the void pylons out on the map to build our gate. Oh. Oh, uh, we, uh, we have to beat this mission with just these few stalkers, don't we? Oh, no. Well, good news for us, Captain. Blink is a really good ability. And honestly, I thought this mission would just be entirely impossible at first, until I discovered a brand new piece of tech. Well, brand new for me, anyways. So, for whatever reason, if you keep your probes on hold position and have units behind the probes, the enemy isn't fond of killing the probes and instead will attempt to chase the units on the other side of the wall for all eternity. That is absolutely incredible for us as that not only allows us to separate priority targets exceptionally well, which means we can target fire them down with minimal risk, but now the melee units in this mission are essentially non-existent. In fact, with this strategy, we actually turn them into a benefit since they tend to get in the way of roaches and hydras, which allows our stalkers to target fire them down with even less risk than normal. And with this, this is huge because by far the biggest threats on the map aren't the mutaswarms or the roaches or hydras, guardians or even the Ultras, Carriers, Immortals, or Colossi. It is the massive swarms of Zerglings that are regularly sent out. So with our probe tech pretty much invalidating those waves, we can now attempt to micro our stalkers with Blink and attack appropriately to advance throughout the map. And the good news is, the more we advance throughout the map, the more stalkers we can find. So, although I would normally struggle to consider 12 stalkers a decent fighting force. It is exponentially better than six stalkers, I'll tell you that much. With all this combined, we can start to progress throughout the map at a relatively decent speed, all things considered. And especially once we get to here, the only Zerg units that can actually attack my stalkers are Mutas, Roaches, and Guardians, all of which my stalkers completely annihilate with proper micro with one exception. There is a Mutalisk wave near the 25 minute mark, which is blatantly unkillable with my current stalker count. So when that attack wave is sent out, we need to reach the Templar base and kill the enemy forces deployed there ASAP. The problem is, although the forces deployed are pretty scary, our probes are much less effective than usual since the Immortal is very fond of prioritizing it over the Stalkers. Which means that the intended play of separating the Zealots and the Immortal from the Carrier and the Scouts is just not feasible anymore. 
At this point, it is 100% up to blank micro and abusing enemy AI. So, the best way I found to go about this was to take down the zealots and the scouts as normal. Then, for the two big threats being the immortals and the carrier, what you can actually do is lure the carrier out, and since it attacks with, you know, interceptors instead of the actual carrier, I found that its leash range is a lot longer than the immortal. So if you're able to pull it off, you can lure the carrier pretty far away from the base, and once it's down, you can just go completely all in with your probes and try to burst down the immortal as soon as possible. And after several attempts, I was eventually able to pull it off with almost no time left on the clock. Remember that Mutalisk wave I mentioned earlier? Yeah, they killed every single structure at my base, with the only survivor being a single assimilator I warped in before I went all in, and even then it was taking heavy fire. It was... extremely stressful, but... Yeah, it actually is possible to beat this mission without placing down this pylon or even building nexuses to artificially increase our supply. I actually came into this video fully preparing to state that this was just impossible, but it actually is doable. But guess what, fuckaroo? This went from bad to worse, because the Spear of Adun was the mission that took me the longest time to beat out of any mission in this entire video series at a resounding, uh... Hold on, I'm pausing the script. Math is help. Um... Seven hours of attempts. So, the reason this took so long was for one big reason. The attack ways on this mission are absolutely terrifying. They're manageable on paper, but with a single pylon to your name and only one base, your defensive capabilities are inherently extremely limited. And that's a problem because you really, really, really need to keep your defenses in good shape because once the attack waves start to break through, you're just dead. And since you only have one pylon, you can't place production facilities reliably because, firstly, this pylon is really inconveniently placed, and secondly, every single forge, gateway, or cyber core plopped down is upwards of four cannons or shield batteries you miss out on. And against the attack waves, that's just not going to work. And here's ultimately the biggest issue with this and the piece of the puzzle that I needed to solve. You need all three of those structures I mentioned. If your defenses fall and you don't have a forge, you die. If you don't have a gateway, you can't make a cyber core, and you can't make any offensive units, which leaves you dead in the water. And if you don't have a cyber core, you can't make stalkers, which are 100% required to beat this mission. So... What you do here is obviously just destroy the main objectives and put down the structures there. Yeah? Sure. But there's issues with that. Firstly, every main objective you take down spawns in an attack wave. Which, the first one is super easy to deal with. The second one is really difficult and you would actively need to time it perfectly. And the third one is just... Suicide. You activate that, and you lose. Also, rather conveniently enough, the attack waves happen to frequently collide with those main objectives. And if a single Zergling alerts the entire attack wave that there's gateways over there, be prepared to say goodbye to every single structure that you place down. And keep in mind, there are infinitely respawning units that are sent over here, so you also need to divert resources into defensive structures. But, don't get it twisted. If you choose to diverge even all of your resources into forward defenses, you're just going to lose all of it anyways. Because for whatever reason, the pylon power field here, instead of being like four, maybe even five tiles long, is three. And since the cannons and shield batteries inherently take up two, your defenses are inherently crippled by 50% 
which means you're not fending off a goddamn thing. So, the first five hours was just trial and error. Finding out what works, what doesn't, and trying to figure out a game plan. Eventually though, we finally got our strategy online. So we immediately rush our starting stalkers to get the resources around the map so we can build up our base defenses ASAP. And if you happen to notice that there's a trapped zealot in here, that's not a mistake. I noticed in other saves that if you keep a zealot contained in your defenses, that the enemies will aggro onto it and try to kill it. And with the interior shield batteries, it is borderline impossible for the zealot to die, which is great because that allows us to save on minerals, since we don't have to replace as many cannons. But after gathering up a decent chunk of resources, we then have to place down two warp gates in a cyber core by this power field, warp in five stalkers, and then casually never lose a stalker. With the attack wave coming in, it's going to inevitably kill off these three structures, and after that, it's up to them. You cannot replace them. They are not expendable. So our new task is killing an entire main objective with five stalkers. That cannot die. So the way we're going to go about this is by abusing a mechanic with Blink. So if you're fighting a ranged unit or structure that has an attack that isn't hit scan for lack of a better word, if the projectile is in mid-air and you blink your stalker before it lands, the attack doesn't land which means your stalker doesn't take any damage. This means some units, for example the Dragoon, Spinecrawler, or Photon Cannon, can be killed with absolutely no damage taken if you blink well enough. The problem is, predictably, the fact that we needed to time this perfectly every time an attack came in. If you blink too soon, the attack is going to be redirected at a different unit, and if you blink too late, you're going to take the damage from the attack. So timing is 100% required here. And, say for example, if there are ever two or three enemies, Micromanaging that can be absolutely brutal. There's also a few things I can't really get too in-depth with before making this a comprehensive tutorial on something nobody is going to do, such as controlling all this while accounting for the pretty decent cooldown, different units having different attack times, animation cues, projectile acceleration rates and visibility, how our enemies having a static plus 3 upgrade lead on us makes every trade significantly harder and how we account for that, how units are different in this patch compared to how they are nowadays, and all sorts of other arbitrary game knowledge. And another thing that we had to abuse was leash ranges. I don't know the StarCraft term for this, but in some missions in the campaigns, if enemy or allied units run too far away from where they're supposed to be, they'll go ahead and stop fighting to run back to their starting location. And luckily for us, the Spear of Adun is one of those missions. However, unfortunately for us, this is extremely inconsistent. And against enemies like the Immortal, which can absolutely shred our stalkers, it can sometimes just be a coin flip whether or not you kill it, or have to reload an old save and try again. This... wasn't all too fun. I had to constantly rebuild my base, keep track of my workers, perfectly micro my stalkers, tie my engagements, keep track of enemy attack ways and when they're sent out, and abuse the AI as much as possible. And... sometimes even if I did everything perfectly, there were still just elements completely out of my control, and I would just lose anyways. So... This took forever, as I've already mentioned, but eventually I was able to get the bottom left conduit down, and this is where the mission turned from an impossible death march to something that is a bit easier and a victory may actually be feasibly in sight. That was because this is the first time in all of my attempts that I can actually put down the structures I've been missing 
and not skip out on defense. This is huge for us, as now I can ease up on the perfect stalker micro a tad bit, and with the increased defensive presence I don't need to spend as much repairing my base as I usually have to. And with one of the big three conduits down, there's a very clear path we can take for the rest of the mission, and we have a forward outpost that we can fall back on if need be. And the fortune doesn't end there, because the next two conduits have a ton of units that can be leashed to hell and back. The only units that were difficult for us were the two immortals and the carrier near the front lines of the last objective. Which is the best possible spot for them to be, so I could just suicide all of my forces in over and over again until it died. And once they're down, the only units left on the map that we can't kite or leash is... I think a Guardian, a few Hydras, one or two spine crawlers, and an Infester? Not really all that difficult of an engagement. And once the forces are down, there's a direct path from this conduit to the next one. All I have to do is target fire the objectives until they're down to 10 HP, run back to my base, get the very first conduit down to spawn in this second attack wave, run a stalker over to the third and fourth conduit, auto-attack them once or twice, get the third and fourth conduit down, beat the mission without having to deal with the attack waves, GG easy. I was... a little bit happy I beat the mission, as you can probably tell. Alrighty, so we're roughly... Two, three missions into the video, uh, how many minutes are we in? Shit. So, uh, I assure you progress will be a lot better now, now that we have access to the Spear of Adun and can actually obtain upgrades. So, I wanted to do Core Hall first, but sadly, although Sky Shield is barely manageable with decent enough Blink Micro, Brothers in Arms was effectively not doable. The hybrid attack ways were just way too bulky for us, and although we could stall them out theoretically forever with the Stalker, when the Disruption Nova event ended, all that stalling would realistically do is set us back even further. So there's just a point in which we were in a death spiral, so instead, we're going to have to do Shakuras first. For our first two unit upgrades, we went with the Stalker and the Centurion. The Centurion just has a decent AoE stun, which is a lot better than the Zealot Spin, especially since they have a really bad tendency to clump on top of each other and melt to splash damage, but really the Stalker just steals the show in particular. So I've already went extremely in-depth with what is possible with Blink Micro, so Go ahead and imagine everything I've talked about, but give the Stalker the ability to regenerate a ton of shields over a very short time span after every Blink ability. Yeah, the amount of potential this thing has is insane. And even with an extremely low Stalker count, with proper micro and engagements, it's possible to make them effectively immortal. The only real way you're going to lose them is if they get one shot, or you can't assure their escape if a situation happens to become dire. And at this stage in the campaign, I think there's literally one unit that can one-shot the Stalker, and funnily enough, I believe it's a projectile you can actually dodge with Blink, so again, effectively immortal. You can abuse this to hell and back, and on Sky Shield, they were pretty much the only reason as to why it was even doable, but uh... There's a little bit of a problem on Shakuris, and it's the fact that you unlock the Dark Templar here. It is more than possible to beat this entire mission without building anything, because you start off with 4 Dark Templar and you're given the Orbital Strike ability which means any detectors that may be in the way are just poof, gone, cease to exist. And this very well might be a controversial hot take, so stick with me, 
If a unit is effectively immortal with proper micro and utilization and game knowledge, I'd consider that an extremely good unit. If a unit is effectively immortal because the only way you can get them to die is if you literally kill them yourself or send them to suicide, you can connect the dots. Oh, but don't you worry, fuckaroo, I bet you were thinking to yourself, hmm, this thing looks pretty cool. But what if it had, um, an invulnerable AoE burst that is also actually a single target burst that does a metric trillion damage on a 15 second cooldown that is also able to be used at range and also makes the Dark Templar immune? If you thought that to yourself, I would highly advise looking into therapy or maybe even a mental hospital. That's absolutely psychotic, but whoopsie doopsie, here we are. The Dark Templar has become anime. I mean, I guess The Last Stand does make it slightly more interesting since you have to use them to their fullest extent. Your supply is extremely low, not expendable, and you have to defend for a really long time. And I guess vaguely speaking of which, although I talked about it earlier, I can talk a little bit more about pylons in depth here. So, just like Supply Depots and Overlords, they are invaluable. Losing them means you lose 8 Supply... forever. Which obviously sucks, and since you start most missions with as low as 18 to 26 Supply, that's something you never want to have happen under any circumstance. However, at least for now, unlike those two campaigns, you are limited to building every single Protoss structure in those power fields, excluding the Assimilator, whoa. And, uh, there's a few problems with that. So, obviously, since we're limited in supply, we don't have the room available to spare forces to defend, which means we need to build defenses. And the problem is, Firstly, those defenses need to compete with space for your other buildings, and secondly, you better hope those defenses are good because if the pylon falls, you don't have any more defenses. You don't have any more supply, and chances are you probably don't have a way to produce any units. So, uh, better reload an old save because the threat of fate has been severed and you're now stunlocked into an existence of decay, attrition, and inevitably death. Luckily though, in this mission, we do start with an entire three pylons, which gives us enough surface area to construct a okay amount of defenses. And as I've said earlier, we needed to use our DTs to the fullest extent. Because not only do we need to destroy the three Zenith Stones, which meant doing this cool anime move over and over and over again, but we also need to assure the survival of our pylons. And against the very scary AoE units sent out, such as the Baneling, or maybe even the Baneling, and especially the Baneling, if we didn't burst those down preemptively, our buildings were in extreme danger. And on top of that, much more hybrid are sent out, including an entirely brand new flying variant, and quite possibly worst of all, Overseers. And their inclusion means that if we didn't use our DTs carefully, they were going to die extremely quickly. Fortunately though, by constantly spamming our cool boy anime move and rebuilding our limited structures whenever they fall, this mission ended up just being barely doable. Although my base was entirely destroyed and the Zell Naga Temple was under siege, my Dark Templar fought valiantly to assure victory. And when the temple was seconds away from its destruction, I was eventually able to overload it and scrape by with a Pyrrhic victory. Anyways, remember how I said that Sky Shield was doable with cool Stalker Blink Micro? It still is, but we've essentially doubled the amount of stalkers we can deploy, and oh yeah, DTs are still a good unit. Who would have thought? And for a pretty cool transition, likewise DTs are used again to a massive extent in Brothers in Arms. 
Like I said earlier, when we first tried this, our main bottleneck was the hybrid. And not necessarily the fact that they were scary, more so we just didn't have enough forces to reliably take them out. However, now with the Dank Templar unlocked and almost double our available supply, since the first few waves sent out aren't detectors, they're unable to retaliate against our DTs. And... Yeah, the Shadow Fury ability is still good. It just completely obliterates the attack waves in as little as 2-3 to three uses. And funnily enough, our base defense also wasn't an issue anymore because of one really strange interaction. So if you secure this research facility, the AI starts to send out medics to go onto the front lines to aid Valerian and Raynor's forces. And one really cool thing about them is that they respawn instantly if they die. So you don't really have to worry about losing them and they're always an option. However, they respawn instantly if they die. And if the attack wave just sees them on their way to my base, this happens. Yeah, they just never advance. Every time they kill the medic and begin to move against our base, another medic instantly spawns which the forces will collectively move out to kill. Which in turn will be replaced with another medic that the force collectively moves out to kill, which will be replaced by another medic, which will be replaced by another medic, and so on and so forth. It is kind of hilarious, kind of depressing, but immensely practical, surprisingly enough. Anyways, by the end, I Shadow Furied enough structures that the constant waves of forces that Valerian and Raynor were sending out were able to actually overcome the stragglers that managed to survive my indiscriminate onslaught. And with a lack of reinforcements being sent out to contest that tug of war, they are able to actually group up a pretty scary army and defeat the remaining hybrid protecting the Keystone Light and beat the mission for us. Which is kind of nice because I sort of lost every single Dark Templar minutes prior. So that's pretty neat. Oh yeah, I probably should have mentioned it by now, but I was too caught up in my balance line. We do have the Orbital Assimilator now, which just like all the other campaigns, is fantastic because it saves us 3 supply per assimilator and allows us to get additional resources on the map without having to long distance mine. And across all 3 campaigns, the assimilator is the most effective variant we've had so far as although gas was massively important on Terran and somewhat important on Zerg, unlike those two races our upgrades cost a bit more, our units and structures generally cost a lot more. Unlike the Terran, we can't long distance mine or take an expansion by lifting off our structures, and unlike Zerg, we don't have the absurdly overpowered twin drones mutation, so... The Protoss really, really like this upgrade. Also, unlike the other two races, we don't have as many good mineral outlets, Although that will shake up just a little bit after the next mission. On Forbidden Weapon, we have yet another playthrough in which we can utilize the Solar Lance to completely trivialize the mission. If you don't know, there's a spot right here where you can use your Solar Lance ability to destroy Pylon on the other side. Which unpowers the gate connecting these two areas, and effectively allows you to skip past two-thirds of the map. And that's not where the utility of the Soar Lance ends. So when you get to this position, there's a mission trigger where warp prisms begin to fly in to activate unpowered defensive structures and secure warp endpoints. However, the warp prisms fly in such an alignment they can destroy all of them with only one Soar Lance ability. And if you do that, that only leaves two fortifications remaining for you to break through. And guess what? Solar Lance can cheese those too. So both of these pretty scary fortifications at the end are kind of pointless, because the way you beat this mission is by getting to this location. It doesn't matter what units get there, and it doesn't matter how many units you kill, all that matters is that you get a unit to this location. 
And guess what? Pylons, yet again, power the gates that act as a barrier to entry. So all you have to do is kill the pylons powering the gates, and just casually run on by while ignoring the forces that attack you. I use the Dark Templar as my unit of choice to do this, but realistically, stalkers or even centurions would also be more than enough to do this. I mean, if you use your sore lances well enough, you can literally just blink a singular stalker in and beat the mission. In fact, you don't even need to unpower the last gate. If you choose to wait until the laser beam is right on top of the last objective, you can just utilize the vision it gains of that location and blink on over. Really, the only benefit we get from using the Dark Templar is that the mission is slightly faster. However, after this mission is over, we gain one of the most valuable power boosts in really any of the campaigns, period. The Energizer. So, these aren't a replacement for pylons. God no, if we lose one, we're still going to lose. However, with the Energizer, we can now warp in more structures within our base and not have to account for our starting pylons being in god-awful places. But now, our previously exclusive defensive structures are able to be utilized offensively. All of the very wonderful buildings we otherwise literally wouldn't be able to use in any offensive capabilities, including shield batteries, Kadar monoliths, and cannons, are now able to be built anywhere. There are downsides to all of this. For example, we do need to assure the Energizer's survival, and obviously every hub we decide to power will cost us to supply, compared to the Terran and Zerg's, uh... None? But goddammit, it still unlocks a huge host of strategies that we otherwise would've never been able to utilize. And for that, you're going to be seeing this little fella throughout most of the challenge. However, uh... Go ahead and ignore everything I just said, as for the next mission, we're going to go ahead and resort to very blatant cheese. So, there is absolutely no way in hell we're going to beat this mission in the quote-unquote traditional way. The enemy attack waves that are sent out are so lethal and are sent out so frequently that there's just absolutely no way a one base economy would be able to effectively defeat them. So what we have to do is immediately bum-rush the mission with our phoenixes. If you are extremely, and I mean extremely proactive with your first few phoenixes, it's actually not impossible to beat this mission within minutes, and hence only have to deal with one attack wave, which is extremely small due to it being the first attack wave. It took quite a few attempts on my part, but there are a bunch of really great routes you can utilize in the dead zones near every lock. This does mean that we can't get the bonus objective here, but it's not really all too much of a concern for us since most of the upgrades that we do want to purchase with Solrite are extremely cheap. But once we get the attack wave down and secure the locks, all we have to do is rush to the last conduit, so our lance all the units protecting it, GG easy. The mission afterwards is a standard hero mission, but the mission after that, we're going back to more comic antics. So on this mission, I decided to utilize our Annihilators, as although DTs can still effectively 100-0 the mission, I did feel slightly more confident with the Annihilator, as its burst damage is ranged, the unit itself is ranged, it's much bulkier, and as you're going to see, it goes alongside the Energizer much better. So, starting off, we're pretty much going to immediately offer High Templar to feed back as many energy units as possible before perishing. Once you feed back the priority targets, namely Spectres and Medics, this crystal becomes extremely easy to reclaim, and the Zerg forces can actually do a small amount of gradual damage. Not really all that much, mind you, but enough that they're not completely useless. The second lock over here, though, is when the comic antics begin to shine. 
Although it's no Immortal, the Annihilator is still a fairly bulky unit. And if we utilize shield batteries with our energizers, it's more than possible for us to eventually whittle away the forces by the second lock with their shadow cannon ability. Although I guess it's like a crystal or whatever. Look, Legacy of the Void is a campaign that is infamous for its very unique objectives, all with progressively stronger forces protecting everyone. I'm going to muddle up the names and scripting, god forbid. Anyways, you do have to pull enemies back into the shield batteries if you piss them off too much. Namely, the hybrid are capable of doing a ton of damage in a really short window, but... Even then, the Annihilator is bulky enough that as long as it has those shield batteries, it's going to live. Other than that though, once you clear the forces right by the crystal, we can just go ahead and target fire the main objective. And just in case, I did end up utilizing our newly unlocked mass recall ability, which assures that in any scenario, the Annihilator is going to escape safely. And the key thing to note on this mission is that there are two attack ways that spawn once you kill the second and third crystal respectively. And they're both pretty scary, but luckily Kerrigan is nice enough that once you clear out the enemy forces near an objective, she won't actually kill the objective. Instead, urging you to send over forces whenever they're available so she can continue her assault on the enemy forces. So we're actually going to keep this first crystal alive until we're able to ensure the third and fourth crystal's death. Which will allow us to beat the mission without having to deal with the attack waves. Until then though, we're actually going to temporarily skip over the third crystal in order to go to the fourth. So with us unlocking the Starfighters two missions ago, we can now utilize their flight in a really nasty way. So what a lot of speedrunners do or at least used to do, is fly a Corsair or Phoenix right here, and spam Spear of a Dune abilities until they're able to destroy it. But honestly, I'd rather keep my Spear of a Dune energy for the third crystal, as I'm not too sure if I'm going to be able to comfortably take it down with my current supply. So instead, what we're going to do is fly Corsair near the same location, but instead of using the Spear of a Dune abilities, what we're going to do is build a few Kadar Monoliths and shield batteries by this objective. Sometimes there is a hybrid who gets pissed off with this strategy, but that's the reason why we built the shield batteries. As with their healing, they're more than capable of killing off the hybrid. But once that one enemy is down, as long as the Corsair retains vision, the Monoliths are actually able to fire it down with no enemy retaliation. And once it's set up, we now have a guaranteed way to clear out the last crystal exceptionally easily, which leaves only the third to destroy. So for the third crystal, I used a similar strategy as to first slash second. And if it isn't obvious, I kind of can't keep track of how I'm supposed to script this since I'm doing the mission in an order of 2, 4, 3, 1 instead of, you know, 1, 2, 3, 4. But I digress. I got my shield batteries up, ran my annihilators in, did a bunch of damage. If I felt like they were in lethal danger, I would use my mass recall ability, then rinse and repeat. And luckily I only had to do this twice, since the vile roaches that were sent out helped me absolutely decimate the few hybrids that remained. And I kind of forgot to mention that I was an idiot and killed the fourth crystal very early on. But for whatever reason, the hybrid were just completely infatuated with trying to kill my Kedar and Monolith, so I wasn't punished for this terrible play and were able to beat the mission. Pretty neato. Afterwards though, we have to choose a planet, and for that I decided to go to Purifier Land instead of Rakshir. Although they're both interchangeable and the order doesn't matter. So for this mission, I had one main strategy. Firstly, I needed to be exceptionally proactive with my starting Colossi to get the starting resources hidden throughout the map. With their extremely long range, the Colossi are able to clear out quite a lot of the map before ever needing assistance. 
And because of that, what I built with the added resources I got didn't really matter, but since I was building energizers anyways, I found that warping in sentinels was always a good choice just due to how much damage they can take. Stalkers were also always a great choice because of their ability to deal with the air units and their survivability with their shield recharge. And vanguards just fit in extremely well with their 1 billion damage burst. So with this, we're able to handily clear up to the third lock, and the megalith is inbound to the fourth. So what we're going to do is use our orbital bombardment ability to clear out the caves of Zerg. Which, trust me, you really need to do, lest a situation like this happens. This did catch me extremely off guard, but luckily with my Colossi and Vanguards, I was able to recover and get to the part that makes this mission extremely easy. So, the Megalith does just completely awful damage. However, it is still extremely aggressive towards anything that comes in its way, so if a unit tries to fight it, and it's in the way of its path, it's going to temporarily stop until that unit is dead. And the great thing about this is, is that it does this with structures too. So if you intentionally leave a bunch of structures alive, it can take the Megalith minutes upon minutes upon minutes to kill it off, and that may not sound like a lot, but trust me when I say it is immensely appreciated. With this newfound time, I built up a pretty good army and moved out to the last Zerg Hive Cluster preemptively without the Megalith. Utilizing our shield recharge to first Hive wasn't all too bad, but when the Nidus Worms begin to emerge, you really need to assure their death ASAP. And luckily, the Vanguard did great at killing the ones that were immediately accessible, but the ones that weren't were a different story. So for that, I needed to utilize a weird spot right here I found in the probes only playthrough. If you just keep a unit right here in this little corner, you gain full vision of the entire Zerg Hive Cluster, which allows you to target down and kill the Nidus Worms with the Spear of a Doom. And that was immensely appreciated because the Megalith finally finished off the godforsaken Roach Warren, and it would be incoming any second now. Luckily with all the damage inflicted, my Stalkers were in a pretty prime condition to clear out the remaining stragglers. There weren't a whole lot of units left that did enough damage to kill off the shields I inherently recharged from Blink. And even though I did eventually just go for the completely brain-dead F2A move play and lose most of them for no reason, I was able to warp in a few more units to finish the job. Then the winged Tussars arrived and the Megalith finally reached our position and didn't do a thing. But it didn't commit suicide violently, and we won because of that. Woo. The next mission, though, I was put in a tough predicament. So, the Zerg attack waves here are... scary. With tons of hybrid, ultras, hydras, mutas, roaches, zergling swarms, and support units, I had to constantly expend resources on defenses. And here's the bad part. We only have 46 supply available. Which isn't an impossible number, but the Zerg here have extremely tight defenses that counter almost every comp I can think of. Mass Gateway just gets decimated with Infestors and Ultras. Robotics Facility units just don't get to exist because Vipers can helplessly drag them into their inevitable demise. And currently our only air unit is the Corsair, which uh doesn't do all too well against everything, really. So, that kind of left us with very unfortunate options. Either we head back to Slain, get the Void Ray and the new Spear of a Dune upgrade, and head back to Pure Fireland, beat this mission in much the same way, and then do this mission with Mass Void Ray, go back to the Spear of a Dune and do this mission again with a very cheesy army comp, a la Mass Dark Templar, or what I ended up deciding would be optimal here, repeated suicide missions. 
run in a unit, gain vision of the null circuit, orbitally bombard it, defend until the next bombardment becomes available, rinse and repeat. And I guess I should clarify, although this does sound like a really dumb cheese, I was actually on the verge of defeat near the end because I needed to stall out two minutes per bombardment, which is roughly about the same interval that the hybrid are sent out. And if I don't have a bunch of energy readily available, that meant I was forced between taking losses or using my valuable energy to clear out the attack wave. Which delayed the mission by... a ton. And by the last lock, all I had left was my four defenses, which were on the verge of death, my base was completely destroyed, and in terms of a quote-unquote army, I had a Corsair, four Stalkers, a Sentinel, and an Energizer. Not really the greatest fighting force the world has ever seen. But at minute 54, I was able to finally wipe out the last Null Circuit, get out of Purifier Land, and move on to Slain. Slain, I decided, was going to be my mandatory haha, look at how funny the Dark Archon is planet, since I needed to include at least two missions of it. And in regards of which planet to do it on, I eventually decided on Slain because the missions are actually pretty simple to beat, even without it. So the first mission is a fun defense-slash-offense setup where you alternate between defending against a massive onslaught of Void Forces, the Taldorim forces that come afterwards, and then being forced to move throughout the map to destroy the main objectives. Unfortunately for us, though, mind controlling the Void Forces just doesn't work. I wanted to say that they just dissolve when the fog rolls away, but apparently you just can't, period. Which is definitely a shame, too, because some of the units in those waves are insanely strong. But fortunately, the Taldrim waves that are sent out afterwards are great because they send out some pretty decent units that you can mind control. In fact, after a certain point, they start sending in fantastic units which when combined with our newly unlocked passive ability, which gives our units a brief period of invulnerability after taking lethal damage, we were able to really grid it up with our Dark Archons and get an army up and running that realistically shouldn't have ever been feasible. And on the defensive note, with our structures and the mind-controlled units we were capturing typically doing fantastic long-range damage, the waves that came in during the fog started to become pitifully weak. And once we amassed our Death Fleet, all we had to do was F2 and A move the remaining objectives, and... That was about it. The same strategy also extended to Rack Shear, although it is exponentially more fun here. Because, since this is the Legacy of the Void campaign, the Taldrim just magically poof in a massive force every few minutes without the need for pesky resources or production facilities or any of that. Which means later on with a decent amount of Darkons, you can easily claim a respectable three Colossi and three Immortals or three Carriers slash Tempests every minute or two. So predictably by minute 28, with these rates in mind, I just had so much Taldorim under my control that the mission turned into a complete joke, and I was able to completely annihilate everything in my way with ease. That's the Dark Archon, you're never going to see them again. I'm also going to go ahead and breeze past the next two missions, as they're both incredibly boring. This one is a slow turtle fest where we're either AFK for Spear of a Dune energy to blast the power cores, or alternatively AFK for energy to slow push with carriers with the Guardian Shell and Mass Recall abilities. Both of these aren't interesting, and both don't need to be analyzed in depth. Likewise, this is a hero mission, and although we are given the option to build units here in the second segment, there aren't any supply intervals, and even if there was, it's more than possible to beat this entire segment without making anything and only abducting units with Karax. So, there's no challenge either way. This mission, on the other hand, is going to be extremely scrappy. 
I needed to use two units I haven't really been able to use in any of my StarCraft challenges yet, and I am so happy I get to finally utilize them. Before we get into that though, I do need to expand a little bit on the early game. So I needed to kill this Void Shard as quickly as possible, and that's kind of problematic because the Void Shards in this mission are absolutely horrid to fight. So I ended up going for more suicide tactics with Orbital Bombardment, Solar Bombardment, and Sentinel slash Stalkers with a Guardian Shell passive. So there's an interaction with the Guardian Shell that we're going to be utilizing a ton here. So if the Guardian Shell passive activates, enemies won't attack or continue to attack that unit. So if you just send out one unit and it happens to proc, all of the enemies de-aggro off of it and that gives you a fair amount of time to retreat or push some more damage. So that's why our units of choice here were the Sentinel and the Stalker. Since they're unable to be surrounded, that short time allows us to blink our Stalker away to safety, and the Sentinel already has a great move speed, but with the ability to resurrect itself upon death and de-aggro enemies again, it's a two-for-one deal and is always a valid option. After juggling this around for a little bit, by the time the first shard is about to go down, we can finally unveil the ultimate Protoss Vessel. And god damn it, it lives up to the title. 1000 health, 1000 shields, a no energy, low cooldown blink ability, a massive AoE stun, a decent AoE burst, and an attack that does a base of 228 damage that it can fire while moving. Yeah, this thing is insane. In other playthroughs, it's sometimes just not worth the 10 supply and over 2,000 resources it takes to acquire, but with our very limited supply and low resource requirements, it is absolutely worth it and it's going to make the next step of our plan immensely easier. We have to go ahead and clear out these two landing zones, which are just crawling with enemy forces ready to fight us and probably kill us. But the MILF ship souls it no problem, and it's about this time I can suicide in my starting units in order to get my Arbiters online. So the Arbiter has a few niche abilities that are going to be massively impactful for us. Firstly is its Stasis Field ability, which, with these defenses online, happily deals with every attack wave that Amon can throw at us. There are a few different strategies that we have to integrate into every attack wave, such as stunning carrier interceptors instead of the carrier wave itself, stunning units to block off the ramp so our enemies can't gain high ground vision, or stunning only select groups of units at a time and alternating them. But it is pretty simple, and luckily with only two Arbiters, we can assure our main tank defense. And if you're curious why I'm putting so much emphasis on this, defending our base isn't strictly difficult, but defending our base with absolutely no losses is an entirely different endeavor, and one that only the Arbiter is capable of fulfilling. Sadly, the cloaking ability doesn't work on structures, so that isn't very valuable here, but there is one other ability that went from fairly niche to absolutely vital for us, and that's the recall ability. Firstly, if our mama ship is ever in peril, just having an ability that can act as a lifeline for it, without wasting a slot on the Spear of a Dune, is immensely valuable. But more importantly is the fact that we can now wall off our allies' landing zones and let them build up their forces without having to kill another Void Shard or possibly luring enemy units towards their location. That doesn't apply to the first landing zone, as that opens up after the first shard anyways and is pretty far away. But for the second shard, and especially the third, it is absolutely integral as there is no way in hell we're sneaking a probe through all of this. So what we're going to do instead is recall a probe and an energizer to construct the wall. And the reason why we're doing this is to assure that Amon never gains vision of our allies and hence never attacks them, but primarily it restricts our allies from moving out. 
because despite them having fantastic units that they constantly produce en masse, they only send out about 30 to 50 supply up most. And with a Void Shard gaining more and more damage, forces, stronger forces, and all that jazz, this ends up being a suicide wave with absolutely no conceivable benefit. So caging them in so they don't constantly send out suicide waves and actually get a solid force up and running is immensely valuable. Also another positive trait is that when the wall is complete, we don't actually have to waste any resources maintaining it. So, when the walls were constructed, this is where I would say I went AFK, but realistically I do still have to pay a lot of attention. I need to maintain my defenses, I need to make sure that my mama ship is still getting off damage, and by far most importantly is the fact that I need my probes to keep mining. Which, at this point, is really long distance mining. This was just a hardcore stalling setup, but I needed to maintain a defense for over an hour before I was comfortable enough with my allies' forces to take down a Void Shard. And not all of them, mind you, but maybe one or two Void Shards. Luckily, during this time, I was able to get down a second Void Shard with my Mama ship, but after enough time passed, I felt comfortable enough with my allies' forces that I let them out of gay baby jail. I thought that they were capable of taking out two shards. And in retrospect, yeah, I think they were capable of taking out two shards. That is, if they decided to not wander in three completely different paths and perish. So... Yeah, I had to repeat this process a little bit longer, but now with the alliance of Alrax forces. Unfortunately at this point, my mothership was also stuck on team defense as Void Crystals now gain a one-shot ability against any unit, which effectively made it entirely unusable. But after another 30 minutes of stalling, I decided to try my luck again. But this time I made sure to secure this area, as well as this area, so that I can wall them off with cyber cores and funnel all of my allies into one strict attack timing. There was quite a bit of stress here since I knew an attack wave would be coming soon, but I ended up timing it well enough that my intended goal ended up going perfectly. With this added aid, I was able to give all of my allies shield overcharge, and they pretty easily managed to kill off the first shard with no issues. And the second one met a similar fate. With our axe bloodhunters and vanguards, our single target damage increased massively, which was our allies' biggest weakness previously. Obviously, barring the terrible pathing. With all this combined, we're able to comfortably attack the Void Shard, which very quickly resulted in its destruction. And we're now on to the final mission of the campaign and the entire series. Now, I do need to address an elephant in the room. If you watch a certain channel who primarily makes StarCraft and WarCraft challenge runs, you may very well be yelling at me for not utilizing a piece of tech. So, there's a weird interaction that you can abuse with the pure fire beam and solar lance that, when used, breaks all of the events in a mission. And this turns out to be immensely useful in quite a few. For example, the host turns from this AFK disaster piece to a cakewalk that you can just F to in a move. Approaching them will be extremely dangerous. More relevant though, in Salvation, no attack waves are sent after your base, meaning we don't need to maintain defenses past the first five minutes. This does unfortunately freeze the timer, but with free reign to do literally anything and everything you could possibly want, you can just go ahead and casually do this. Hierarch, I see an unending tide of Protoss signatures. He's sending every last one of the possessed Templar against the Keystone. We will hold, Karats. 
We must. So if it isn't blatantly obvious why I haven't included it, breaking the game, although kind of hilarious, isn't really a satisfying conclusion. And I suppose if my intention was to do that, making a billion Dark Archons would probably be a little bit more cinematic. So, on to the actual conclusion. For worse and for worse, I decided this would be the mission in which I got rid of my Spear of a Dune supply, and also outlaw any of the cheese strategies. And, my god, that was not a great decision. So, first and foremost, we need to utilize our forces at the beginning extremely well. I find that using the Sentinel is always good, the Vanguard is still a king as always, and for the first time ever, I decided that it was time for the Stalker to be dethroned. The Adept will instead take its place here, as with proper utilization, it is more than possible to use your shade ability on every enemy in every attack wave. And I think it goes without saying, but a static plus 5 damage on every attack is insane. And if you combo that with units that have splash damage or multiple attacks, take for example our previously mentioned Vanguard, that's an extremely casual damage increase of uh... 80 per attack? Yeah, they're pretty damn good. Other than that though, shield batteries aren't usually the best on this mission, as enough damage is dealt that they tend to run out of energy extremely quickly, but with our allies pretty much being our only source of fighting units, yeah, we need to assure their survival for as long as possible. Speaking of which, I actually wasn't able to chrono boost my mama ship in time, which resulted in me getting it at the 13 minute mark, when I should have had that at least 3 or 4 minutes ago, which wasn't great. But fortunately, the mama ship is pretty much capable of defending the central path single handedly, which is the main reason why we wanted her as this path is by far the most aggressive and fragile, hence it's the one that usually falls the fastest. But afterwards we do need some actual support units, and for that, I needed Arbiters. Firstly, as always, the Arbiter stealths our allies, which is... debatably useful. You really have to keep their positioning in mind as if you don't, either the Arbiter can be sniped down, which is obviously not great, or alternatively, the enemy can start bursting down your buildings as they are cloaked, which usually means your allies will try to push forward a bit more, and that usually leaves them in a much more vulnerable position. You need to keep them at a range where they're actively with your allied forces and cloaking them, but not far enough ahead where those two concerns come to pass. I found this extremely helpful with Karax, as with very little support, he's essentially able to be entirely self-sufficient. It kind of helped out with Alarak, but with Vorazun, she was just not having a good day. She was never really able to get her DT, Dark Archon, or Voidray count up, which means I found myself reinforcing her the most. Despite my intention to keep the mothership by Alarak, I'm pretty sure I used her about twice as much by Vorazun instead. And this very awkward positioning made a lot of the mission super micro-intensive. And I forgot to mention one thing in particular about Alarak that made it even worse. If he lost his foothold for even a minute, I can say goodbye to over a quarter of my available supply since this is the only entrance with pylons near it. And as I've said previously, this is usually the entrance that crumbles over the fastest. Woo. Eventually at the end, although everything was dying exceptionally quickly, I was fortunate enough that the enemies were positioning themselves in such a way that I was able to pretty much wall them off at the entrance with my Arbiters. 
And my mothership had enough energy reserve to also reinforce Vorzoons and Aurax positions with Vortexes. Stalling wasn't how I would imagine this to finish, but I can't deny it. With this victory in hand, I was able to beat Legacy of the Void on Brutal without constructing additional pylons or nexuses. And in fact, excluding this one overlord which I hate with all of my being, the entire trilogy is possible with this rule set. And I think that's pretty neat. And I also sincerely hope that you thought it was neat too. Mostly because this was an extremely long endeavor that lasted over two and a half hours, and I don't know why you would watch all this if you didn't at least have a passing interest. But, uh, it's outro time now. So now I get to show my Patreon and patrons. There's no sequel prompt here because there's no sequel. And there is no epilogue or Nova Covert Ops in Bossing Say. As always, a massive thank you to Parabellum, Aiden, Jacob S, Michael P, Droopy, Breadman, Catapultman1, Chair, Judge and Jury, Love Kitten, Naho Yuzu, Skarner Crystalline, Teddy Bear Guy, Cray, Minister of Sauces, Mr. Bones, Pyro Musical, and Angus JS. Your support means a lot, and if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't be able to spend a month on this disaster piece of a project. Whether or not that seems like a good trade deal is debatable. It's no GameStop or whatever the cool kids are investing in nowadays, but at least it's not Dashcon. As always, if you want to have your name read in an extremely monotone voice, which has previously been described as, and I quote, a Midwestern deranged Morgan Freeman, exclusive bug videos where I spoil my dog for an immense amount of time on camera, and what can objectively be considered drawings, feel free to click the link on screen or in the description. Either way though, if you're watching and listening to this, you've helped me out way more than you probably think, and you're pretty cool for that. Parasocial Sentimentality